Hello, hello everybody, and welcome to a presentation about Castle Game Engine and kind of our new features that we have just recently developed related to how you can use the engine in your Delphi applications. So let me start with a short overview of what is Castle Game Engine, how you can use it, and we will then see how it all connects with the Delphi and what uh, cool things you can do here. And my point here is also to like, mm, explain to you how you can use it to make games but also we kind of have another use case that i want to propose to you is that you can kind of just use the engine as part of an existing delphi fire monkey or vcl form and you can use the engine to just provide the visualization of some amazing 3d model that you have in your application okay so that's like a spoiler, essentially. Um, okay so let's go ahead uh, so custom game engine it starts with its own like editor so we have our own Castle Game Engine application that is, uh, I mean, you can go ahead and download it from Castle slash uh, from CastleEngine.io. And the basic tool of our engine is our Castle Game Engine editor. Now we have here kind of uh, our own like uh, application project management. So you can go ahead and you can open an existing project or open one of the numerous examples in the engine. I will just go ahead and I will start by opening a quick empty project just so you can see how it like works from the scratch, okay? So when you create a custom game engine project, well, what it really is is just a set of Pascal units and then that are using custom game engine units and then some data. And this data is, of course, something you can edit and by default it will be displayed in your game. So here we have started with an empty project and I can let me customize it to actually show something interesting, okay? So the first, I guess, thing you usually want to do in three-dimensional games is you want to create a three-dimensional viewport. You can move around with it. It's kind of, I mean, it's deliberately like similar to many other game engines that you may have known. And uh, you can put stuff there, okay? So let me actually put something interesting here. So the viewport is something that kind of displays your three-dimensional and two-dimensional scene inside. Let me just go ahead and put something. Like we have here some interesting box. Let's put some light. Let's give some shadows, okay? Oh, ah, uh, the shadows not in this, <laughs> not in, not in, on this GPU. It will not work. Uh, anyhow, so let's go ahead and then create some boxes, and we can activate physics. So I can go ahead. I can create a collider for this box, and I can create another collider for this box. All right. And uh, and can now run the physics simulation. Okay, so by default they just fall down into infinity. But if I bring them back and now I can go to my plane and I can say that okay, I want my plane to also act as a collider. Okay, and now they will kind of bump on the they will stop on the plane. Okay, so that's kind of your very first uh, like feature, I guess, of Castle Game Engine that you can have three dimensional stuff. And this three dimen those three-dimensional things that you see, well, they can uh, be affected by physics. And as you can see, we have a number of primitives here. We have uh, as well a number of... Uh, you can also load some three-dimensional models from formats like GLTF and XVD and so on and so on. Let's try dropping those things too, okay? And you can also shoot some things. For example, let me just add a sphere. Let me make the sphere into a bullet, okay? So I will go collider, sphere collider, and there we go. Now I have some sphere. Now I'm going to add some initial velocity for the sphere to allow it to move, okay? Mm. Yep, sorry. So I think that this will be good. I'm usually like overshooting things, okay? But this is actually good. This is what I wanted to show, right? So uh, the sphere collides with the boxes and you have a basic physics simulation happening here. All right. So that's your like, like your basic, I guess, entry point into the Castle Game Engine. So as you can now, a bit of overview so after this short demo. Yeah. So on the left side, we have a component hierarchy. And as you expect in a Pascal game engine, I mean, this is, uh, those are things that are components, those comp, they are actually classes descending from the T component class and you can design them well, however you want. On the right side, you have something that is, well, it's an object inspector, right? So it's kind of our own object inspector uh, that will maybe with time kind of be a little more, um, 
more more different, I guess, from this traditional Delphi IDE. But yeah, it's just an object inspector, so I don't really have to explain too much to you. Okay. And at the bottom, you have well, what I've already shown you. You have the uh, project data, right? So the files that are part of your project. In the empty project, well, there isn't really that much stuff. But let's go ahead and let's create a new project from something more interesting. So let's create a project from the three-dimensional template, okay? Oh, sorry, I had this one already. All right. So this project starts with a little bit more stuff inside, okay? And it looks like this. So we have kind of a level, but when I right-click with my mouse, I can kind of move around here. And then I can design stuff again. So I can, for example, duplicate this, Control D, and I have another soldier. Now those soldiers are loaded from the GLTF model, which is one of the standard model formats that we support. We support many others, Colada, XVD, VRML, STL, and so on and so on. So you can load your models from a number of three-dimensional formats. You can design those, mo those models, for example, in Blender or 3ds Max or Maya, well, basically anything you would like to. And then, yeah, you can kind of use them and just uh, show them. I mean, you, you, you can display them and you can arrange them on your level in any way you would like to. As you can see, we have also like our own um, our own light management here. I mean, you can kind of design the lighting in the Blender, but you can also use our own components for designing the lighting. Uh, for example, here we have a directional light, which is uh, kind of a bit boring, let's say. So let me change it to a spotlight, okay? And this is how the spotlight works. I mean, it's a bit more dramatic, I guess, in this case, okay? So I can go ahead like this, and uh, yeah, I can drag it out on the level, and I can show some interesting things. Okay, so three-dimensional stuff physics, GLTF models, and uh, ah, inside of this, we have also camera management, okay? Because here I'm kind of moving around on the level like as a designer, yeah? So I can view whatever I want. I don't really have any collision detection. I mean, I could activate it, but I don't. I don't want to. And I can move with any speed I want, as slow or as fast as I would like to. But of course, as a normal player, well, you won't probably you will not probably want to give normal player so much flexibility. So inside your level, there is something called the camera. And you can like look at the preview from the camera. How does it look like? The camera is actually visible at this place of the level, OK? And you can move the camera. You can, for example, move it like this. And as you can see, like in this preview, this preview keeps showing you what is actually visible from the user perspective from this camera, OK? So whatever I'm doing in my world, this preview keeps showing me what is happening on the camera. Um, and if I would run the game, which I will do in a second, then we will actually see, like, you know, the user will actually see the, first of all, the view that this camera is showing. Another thing we have, we have kind of a ready navigation methods. So the idea is that the terminology, the terminology is that the camera is, determines what you see. Now, the navigation, determines how you can change what you see. And we have a number of navigation methods defined for you. You can also, of course, like invent yourselves, invent your own navigation methods. Uh, those are listed here. Basically, I guess the most commonly used our navigation method in games is the walk navigation. And the idea of the walk navigation is very simple. So you use the traditional AWSD keys to navigate in your world. You can have some collision detection. And uh, yeah, and that's it. And you can also have a gravity, OK? Mm. So let's go ahead and try to actually run it. Uh, there are actually two ways that you can do to run it. One is to execute the game engine execute compilation and then execute your actual application from here, play stop application or just run compile. And underneath it will use the Pascal compiler that you have configured, which in this case is of course Delphi. And then another one, way to run your application, which I'm actually going to use now, is just to open your project inside Delphi, okay? So I have already done it, but it's not this project, okay? So I'm just opening in Delphi the project called uh, Oh, it's a conundrum. Which one is it? <laughs> I guess it's the one with the longer name. Okay, so I'm just opening in Delphi uh, the project. And it's a, as you can see, like it's a regular Pascal code. And you can pretty much do well when you know your way around Pascal. You can do here anything you want. Uh, the important units are inside the code subdirectory, but that's just a convention in our engine. 
And another kind of convention in our engine is that the game is usually split into something like states. States are kind of similar to Delphi forms, in, however, they can be placed on top of each other. So, for example, you can have a state play and it can be covered by the state options. So, like you, have, you can have a stack of states and then you can push and pop things on that stack. Or you can just change the stack to something completely different, okay? Uh, but the main point here is, I guess, that when you want to modify something, you know, when you want to modify something in the traditional Delphi application, your first, I guess, you, you, your, your first way to go around it is I want to edit the code of the form. So analogy to this in Castle Game Engine, when I want to modify something in Castle Game Engine, my first, like, approach here was, would be to modify the state. The state defines some useful methods. For example, what happens when the state starts, stops, what happens, uh, the update method is what happens like continuously. It is continuously all the time, more or less 60 times per second called on your level, on your, on your game, and you can do in the update, well, you can update, you can animate anything you would like to. And the press method, as you can guess, is responsible for handling uh, key and mouse, and mouse will presses to okay so if i would like to do something here for example right now this says that if i press the button left then play a sound and if i click on the enemy then this enemy will disappear okay uh should we do something different well we can try actually okay so let's say that uh ah, but first let's actually run the game as it is supposed to be okay so as i said this is just a delphi project okay it's just using delphi units uh custom game engine units and i can run it into the debugger I can compile it in Delphi and I can run it in the Delphi debugger just as any other uh, Delphi application. Which is also another pointer, I guess, for you. If you want to integrate, for example, your custom game engine game with, uh, well, with anything, for example, with database component, with networking component, uh, then you can just go ahead and use whatever you use currently. You can you know, just, you know, use MySQL uh, connection to your existing database. You can use your existing code base. You can. Because it's just Pascal. I mean, it's just Pascal. It's just getting compiled with the Delphi. And then uh, the whole custom game engine is really two things. So it's an editor to design stuff, and it's a set of units, just regular Pascal units that you can combine with your code base however you want. Okay, so the way the game works, the game, the demo, the way it works by default is I'm kind of moving around using this walk navigation and the gravity that I kind of advertised to you a second ago. I can go ahead and I can do some jumping and I can click on those guys and I can, I can kill them, okay? So let's try to do some modifications just to see that it's, well, kind of of trivial okay so instead of hurting the enemy when i'm pressing the right mouse so the left mouse button instead of hurting them well let's see what we can do so the enemy is kind of a behavior the enemy is actually attached to a transformation that is guiding this enemy throughout the world so what i can do but i can say okay when i click on someone transform this person this enemy in this case for example higher okay so I'm accessing the translation vector of the enemy. Well, let me just bump it, okay? So let's go ahead like this. Let's put it one meter higher. So one unit in the y-axis higher. Y-axis is responsible for the up vector in our engine, a convention. That's a similar to most other game engines, okay? And let's see whether what I made has actually you know, made some effect, okay? So let's go ahead. Uh, don't worry about this. I didn't place the necessary DLLs. Oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then let's see what happens. Yeah, it works. <laughs> so that's, I guess, the silly demo. Uh, but what I've shown you, I mean, I really invented this, like, I, I'm always trying to invent something silly when doing this. So this time I invented this, and as you can see, I'm like, it really did the necessary modification in our game. We can use Control m to have a mouse to can actually look at all those guys uh, walking in thin air. Of course, that's because they don't have the physical components defined for them. We could give them some gravity, of course, but I won't go into this because I don't want to keep uh, to take too much of your time. But of course, we could make them affected by gravity. And then what I would do is I could also apply a physical 
force to actually like physically in a realistic way kind of bump them up okay so i could like do it in a more fancy way than what i've shown you right now but i guess i hope this is like a good demonstration that well it's all just Custom game engine, it's all just Pascal classes that you can modify. They just have simple properties like translation, and I can just modify them at any point I want, and it just and just works. Okay. Um, so what more do we have? So uh let's uh, open some other demos. I mean just one. I will not want to talk too much. So this is a two-dimensional game demo. Mm. And actually, the most the most important point I want to make here is that it works very, very much similar to the three-dimensional demo. I mean, it is actually using the same components, the same cameras. However, the camera here is by default in the orthographic projection, so it's, it's it doesn't have perspective. So the object, it doesn't matter how far away is the object from the camera. You can see it. Yeah, the same, whatever. And then it uh, for the animations, where it uses uh, Castle Scene, which was created in Spine. It's a 2D animation package, so we support it also. And it's also using the sprite sheet for animation. So the sprite sheet is basically a set of uh, images, like one image after another, after another, after another. The kind of advantage of using sprite sheet for 2D games is that they are simple to create. And they all offer some cool tricks. And in our engine, we support spreadsheets. We also actually have our own um, uh, our own format for spreadsheet, and you can actually design animations there of the spreadsheet, and you can uh, yeah, you can kind of create the spreadsheet from the source images yourself, and control it however you want. And once you have created the spreadsheet, you can load it into something called Castle Scene. I didn't mention it before, but basically our Castle Scene is a way to render pretty much any external format. So it handles sprite sheet now. You don't know that it handles sprite sheets, spine animations, GLTF animations, XPD, VRM, Colada, STL, and so on and so on. So you can actually place a lot of stuff in Castle Scene, a lot of two-dimensional and a lot of three-dimensional stuff. And uh, yeah, it will render it. No? Uh, what more? So the viewport is not really everything that we have in Castle Game Engine. Uh, well, first of all, the viewport is a, so the viewport is actually a user interface. So I can do something like this. Okay. So what just happened? Well, what happened is that now my viewport that I have treated like a game, like a like a user interface, well now I have viewport that doesn't take all the screen. And I can even duplicate it, okay? So I can have multiple viewports displaying any world I want in my game. They can display one shared uh, world, like, for example, imagine a security camera in a game that kind of gives you a sneak peek into some part of the level. And I can also place completely independent worlds in my viewports. And the viewports are kind of powerful because you can even place them inside buttons and other things. And yeah, about the buttons. So I started that, well, we actually have a full, like, it's not full, but it is fully capable, uh, a hierarchy of user interface controls in Castle Game Engine. They are, um, I have to like, be explicit here. Their point here is not actually to compete with the existing Delphi or FireMonkey, VCL, whatever uh, components. There's not even so much of them, yeah? Just these ones. But actually, even just uh, four or five of them are pretty much commonly used. Um, the thing is that they are, uh, however, they are much more uh, flexible in how you can combine them. For example, anything can be a child of anything else, and anything can have its style adjusted, which allows you to create in your particular games where well, the user interface that you want that is kind of integrated with the graphic style of your game. And in turn, this kind of increases the immersion of players inside your game, OK? And I started by saying that you can even place the viewport inside the button. Yes, yeah, so let's go ahead. So this is my giant button, and this is my weird viewport. And I'm just going to place it inside like this, OK? And now when I drag this thing along, it's actually showing me the viewport of my uh, the viewport containing my uh, dragon. Okay, and this is actually kind of cool. I mean, this demo is kind of silly, but I can quickly actually turn it into something that is less silly. Because imagine that you don't really have here anything except this dragon. Okay, so it looks like this. And now the next thing I will do. Oops, sorry. 
And now the next thing I want to do is I want to place this dragon in the middle and I want to make this viewport transparent, okay? So if you ever wanted to have like a button with a dragon, and now you can have it, okay? And you can have multiple viewports here, okay? So, oh, sorry. So you can have multiple viewports, you can have multiple dragons essentially on your screen uh, going around this, okay? So the point that I'm really trying to make here is that you can have multiple viewports and the viewports are kind of lightweight. You can have one viewport in your entire game displaying some big three-dimensional world, but you can have a hundred of the viewports. You can place them in buttons, whatever, and it all kind of works. And this is what I mean, kind of our reason to have our own user interface possibility inside Castle Game Engine, is that this makes like all those connections possible. So like every component can be, well, more or less every component can be a child of any other component. Mm. Okay, so I think this was a very much quick introduction of the to the Castle Game Engine. That's more or less what I wanted. Oh, there's one more thing, but I will not show it to you because it's about sound. Okay, so one additional feature is that we have a three-dimensional. I mean, it can be three-dimensional sound, so you can attach sound effects to your existing things that walk around the world, and you can play sounds. We have integration with OpenAL and FMOD uh, commercial uh, sound middleware, and uh, yeah, it rocks kind of. Um, okay, another, I guess another point about Castle Game Engine and the school editor is that it is cross-platform. So you can develop your games for Windows, Linux, Mac OS, or mobile, uh, Android and iOS, or Nintendo Switch. We have support for Nintendo Switch console. And this editor, it actually also is cross-platform application. You can use the engine on, you can use it on Windows, but you can also use it on Linux, Mac OS, even the Raspberry Pi. So you can kind of use the engine on in many environments, in various operating systems. And uh, yeah, I'm kind of proud of it. Okay. Uh, okay. So let's go ahead, I guess, with the last but kind of a big thing that I wanted to show during this presentation. Um, so the thing that and then this is kind of special because this is like an announcement of this feature actually i haven't yet announced it before i was actually working on it intensively right before this presentation so since the demo of this presentation this code range is kind of a delphi for enterprise so i realized that what i'm showing here you is kind of how to make games but you may think like okay but we don't want to make games or we just have an existing big application and what we really want to is just to show some pretty three-dimensional or two-dimensional model inside our existing delphi application and this application may already have some forms designed using a vcl or fire monkey so i kind of develop a feature to actually make this possible uh, this feature is called t castle control component uh, so the way it works so you have a set of mm, Let's say our still changes. Um, so the way it works is you have a set of uh, Castle Game Engine um, packages, of course, <laughs> and you can install them inside your Delphi. And in particular, there's a package responsible for providing the FireMonkey component, and there's a package responsible for providing the VCL component. They work pretty much exactly the same except one thing that we have to iron out, but the goal is to really have them behave and be equally useful. And this is how it looks like in your form, okay? So this is no longer custom game engine editor. This is just Delphi, okay? And inside this Delphi, I have this custom control uh, component, and this is the component that have been installed by installing this Castle base and Castle VCL uh, package, okay? And I can do on this component, well, I mean, it's a regular Delphi component, so I can, for example, uh, resize it, okay? So I don't really have to depend on, okay? So I can go ahead like this and I can create like multiple instances of this Castle control too, okay? So I can place it as a regular control on my VCL forms alongside where normal VCL controls, normal VCL label, memo, and so on and so on. And then another thing is that uh, if I would like to design something in our Castle Game Engine editor, but then kind of load it, into, into into this custom control, then we have a ready property. It's called the design URL. So if I navigate to the container, design URL, there it is. It's showing me test to the Castle user interface. And if you go ahead and actually open this project inside Castle Game Engine Editor, then we will be able to actually see 
this design. Okay, so this is the data. This is the test. Um, I think it's test 2D. Okay, so this is the thing that I have designed using Castig Image Editor. I have saved as test 2D Castle user interface. And then in Delphi, I have loaded it by pointing the Castle control to the test 2D Castle user interface. And there you have it, it works. And then uh, you can, of course, modify it. So the sample code that we have here is actually changing the design URL between a few things. I will show a demo of it in a second. And of course, you can access all the Castle Game Engine API from here. So you have a container that is basically a container for Castle Game Engine specific components. And it can contain user interface. You can, it can contain three dimensional transformations, viewports, and everything that you so uh, five minutes ago. So you can place everything you want here. You can design it in the editor. You can design it from code if you wish to. You can create all those components from code too. And you can modify them from code. Mm -hmm. You can also kind of go ahead and even do your own rendering. So if you have your own um, approach, actually, like, like how to how to render stuff, well, you can construct them in our engine using specific X3D nodes, but you can also go ahead and just write your own rendering code. And this example actually contains, well, extremely simple example of how it would look like just to render a simple rectangle and then how to render a simple text. But then if you have an existing application that is also already using some OpenGL commands, for example, just doing direct OpenGL manipulation, then you can also utilize it because here you can just place OpenGL commands and well, it will work. You have to follow some guidelines, of course, how to be properly integrated with the engine. But basically, OpenGL commands can be used directly here too. So you can integrate your existing uh, rendering pipeline with the Castle game engine. And uh, yeah, that's, I guess let's go ahead and let's run it. And then I will just briefly show that we have a very similar equivalent thing for FireMonkey, okay? So this is the two-dimensional, mm, this is the two-dimensional uh, demo. And here we have some UI, uh, nothing happens, just buttons, okay? And here we have some three-dimensional demo. It is showing some animations from GLTF. Okay, and I can use the examine navigation to kind of zoom in, zoom out, uh, rotate around this model. And uh, yeah, it doesn't really have anything happening here. Yeah. But at one point, you can imagine that you can turn it as much as you want into a game or not. You can just keep it like, you know, a visualization or of whatever enterprise thing you may have, for example, a graph of something or a, how, how it looks like, in, for example, if you make something that is controlling some factory, where well, you can display this factory in a three-dimensional view here. What is the mach each machine doing? What is the state of each machine? And so on and so on. So you can use it for games or non-games to display what kind of whatever you want. Okay, so this is a short demonstration of how it works in the VCL, in this case form. This was the VCL form on Windows. And then we have, well, this one won't be too much surprising because we have well, exactly kind of the same thing. It can also work in the FireMonkey. Okay, so this is a regular FireMonkey form. It also has a T Castle control component. It can do the same things. It can render directly or it can load some predefined designs. Uh, let me just go ahead and let me run it. It will actually work the same, but I have prepared a bit different uh, 3D models there. <laughs> so I'm going to show them. Yeah. Anyway, so this is a two-dimensional uh, kind of a UI thing inside the game. You have some labels and you have some image. You can go to the 2D, and this actually shows that our physics also works in two-dimensional games or visualizations. And then we have a 3D thing. And in this case, it shows you that you can actually use uh, physics, like all those silly spheres that have sphere colliders. And you can combine them with some existing GLTF models. Oh, and we have the exam navigation here again. So like whatever you do, whatever you visualize, you kind of out of the box. I mean, it's just one click almost literally one click to add an exam in navigation into your design. So you can visualize and you can allow the user to kind of inspect your three-dimensional model uh, however you would like to. And uh, that's actually more or less everything I wanted to tell you. Um, if this 
sounds nice, then go ahead and visit our website, castleengine.io, or just put Castle Game Engine in your internet search box. And then, yeah, it's an open source game engine, so you don't have to pay for anything, although we very much would appreciate your support on Patreon. Uh, you can use it for to create an open source or not open source application. You can use it freely to create a proprietary applications. It's licensed on the LGPL terms. L, lesser GPL terms, which pretty much means that you don't have to share your the modification. You don't, of course, you don't have to share the, your own code of your application. You can just use the engine. And uh, that's actually it. Open source game engine, and I hope you like it. And yeah, if you like it, go ahead and download it. And uh, I think that's actually it. I promise to be half an hour, almost made it. And then, thank you. I guess now I'm waiting for questions. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Okay, so addressing some questions. So first of all, thank you all for the nice words. Mm, does it work with Skia components? I do not know, um, admittedly. I haven't tried it yet. Uh, it does kind of just you know, cooperate with any FireMonkey component that you can put on your form. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, the engine rendering though is using the FireMonkey native like uh, rendering method, which means that the custom game engine component will be always on top of the other FireMonkey component. But other than that, you know, just put on your phone whatever FireMonkey component you want, and it will cooperate with the custom game engine control. Uh, okay, addressing the next question from Frank: Is there a multiplayer mode uh, not built into the engine? But uh, there is. I mean, we can use ex external. Uh, you can use external um, uh, libraries to achieve multiplayer mode. Let me actually show you some things that we are planning to. I shouldn't have stopped my sharing. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we actually have uh, like done an integration with one open source multiplayer framework that is using the RNL uh, network library from Benjamin Rousseau, from Benjamin Rousseau, sorry. And you have kind of made a game called Not Quake. And this game is something that you can actually download and play right now. And I'm sorry it has kind of a programmer graphics, but it works. I mean, you can shoot other avatars and you can chat with each other. And it's really a multiplayer game happening over the internet. And uh, it's being rendered, like processed by Castle Game Engine. And then it's using the Arinel real-time network library from Benjamin Rousseau. And yeah, it kind of just works. We have other uh, kind of uh, we have other like plans related to it. In particular, there is something called the Nakama, which is a scalable server for social and real-time games and apps. Long story short, if you know something like Photon from Unity. This is kind of an open source version of it, okay? So we are going to be integrated with it, and this will provide you kind of a um, multiplayer game that is also very easy to create because you can even like you know throw some components and just say you know make it multiplayer, which essentially okay synchronize my game state with the server, and we we'll just do it. So we we have uh, like an existing examples how to integrate Castle Game Engine with Arnel, and we plan to have more. The goal, the long-term goal is probably that this Nakama of components to support Nakama will become our like official multiplayer support. But whatever happens, you will always have the option to essentially use any networking library you want with connection to Castle Game Engine. Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Let me go how count the question, the running speed. Oh, that's not for me. Thank you, you did this. I hope that the physics can actually make anything fun because the physics makes anything kind of unpredictable. So I very much encourage you to play with physics even if you're not making game. I mean, whatever three-dimensional model you have or two-dimensional as you saw, you just throw physics there and interesting things will happen. So yeah, uh, with physics we use right now the craft physics engine. I mean, it's not the question. But I'm following. Uh, so if you're curious about what physics engine do we use right now, we use Craft, which is a physics game engine also done in Pascal by also Benjamin Rousseau. And then uh, we plan actually to have some more alternatives. I think we will have next year an alternative to use um, either Bullet or Physics 
uh, together with the Castle game engine. So yeah, the physics is kind of a big thing, which is why I'm usually showing it was one of the demos in Castle game engines, because it's cool. All right, thank you. And uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you all for the nice words. Okay. I think I chaotically answered all the questions. Yeah, I think you did. Um, sorry, I had stepped away to get a drink and you got finished early. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't catch on the question about working with Skia. Did you, did you answer that one or what was the answer on that one? Not really. I avoided that one. The answer is okay. that I haven't tried it yet. Uh, it should work basically with any FireMonkey component. I mean, you can just place those two on the form, and I'm sure there won't be any problems. Um, but for any like deeper integration, it's something to be explored. Yeah. The the game engine renders in its own space on the form. Is that the idea? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it should totally work. Just I would ex expect it should work fine. Um, yeah. So there's a question. Conrad's asking, how big is the game engine? How much, if you just make a hello world in a game, how much bigger is that than a hello world in regular Delphi? Mm, I haven't measured it recently, but the increase in size, well, okay. Assuming, of course, that we're talking about the release builds with the debug symbols, strip, and so on. Well, you will get a few. Ah, I don't want to lie to you, no, but. I, I would expect between 10 and 20 megabytes actually be added to your exercise. So the, that's because actually when you actually even try just to add a, you know, a hello world, like a single cube, you are more or less pulling by dependencies most of the engine. So when you put some simple scene, I guess you will see an exercise increase. And I'm sorry, I'm not prepared to say how much, but I can honestly say that yes, the exercise will increase. But the good news is that it will not it will not keep growing. <laughs> you are essentially pulling, I guess, a lot of the basic dependencies of the engine, like the viewport and the three-dimensional renderer when you just start using it, and then you have it. <laughs> so yeah, if the exercise is precious to you, well, there's I guess uh, yeah, then we can talk about it. Yeah? But long story short, we do have a lot of components, a lot of classes and a lot of components, and they do increase the exercise. And if this is a like you know critical thing for you, then we can just tackle it. I mean, we can talk about it in details. Uh, what about the Cipro? Oh, yeah, I was gonna say I expect that if you start adding uh, graphic assets and models and stuff like that, that's probably gonna have a bigger impact on your distributal size than the engine itself. Exactly. I mean, that's why we actually haven't prioritized uh, like caring about exercise, I guess, too much. Because if, when you make a practical game, you know, your first asset will probably be 100 gigabytes. And then the games on PC, Switch, even on mobile, okay, on mobile, not so much. But a game that weighs one gigabyte isn't really anything special. So in this, like, you know, the exercise is not your practical bottleneck. In case of typical yeah. games, yeah, I get that there are some special uh, use cases. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, yep. So that's why we haven't like focused on it specifically. Right. Yeah, and I would say even most applications, uh, exe site. It used to be it was a really big deal, but anymore, uh, it's not going to be. And I would say that uh, if you are comparing a, a Delphi application made with Castle Game Engine compared to like a uh, Chrome or not a Chromium. Uh, What's it called when you electron based application? <laughs> you know, you're and that electron is kind of the standard everybody uses right now for desktop applications. And you, you got a lot of space before you're going to be anywhere near the size of those. But yes. anyway, how about before C++ your users? Yeah. 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 So that's something I'm actually looking for. I mean, I. Yeah, so, so not yet, but I'm kind of excited about it. We have not yet like uh, adjusted all our components to have those constructors and some other details to be compatible with C++ Builder. So the answer is no, but this is something I'm really looking, looking into it because like this is actually something that Delphi opens up for us and it's extremely cool that you could just have those Pascal classes and they are kind of, they are just also C++ classes with extremely little effort. However, I did not yet do this minimal effort, but I am looking into it because this is, this is an exciting feature of Delphi, essentially, to kind of be able to also uh, be uh, good for the C++ people. So not yet. That's an answer. OK. Uh, could it be loaded with models like IGES or STEPS? I 
don't know those models actually, but what I can tell you is that you can actually define your own uh, model format. I mean, you can you can define your own loader for any model format. You have you have I think like twelve model formats supported in the engine. Uh, not all of them on the same level. You kind of focus on GLTF and so on. But basically, if you go to the Castle Game Engine source code, you can find a lot of examples how to define your own loader for the three or two D dimensional models. And it's kind of easy because we have something like an let's call it an intermediate format because the way we do it is that we load the models from whatever format they came in into x3d nodes x3d is an international standard for uh, three-dimensional and two-dimensional graphics and we kind of pull anything you throw at us into x3d nodes which is kind of cool because it makes those writing those importers for various uh, formats really easy and you can also uh, combine things. For example, you can load something that contains animation data, and you can combine it with another model that contains. Where's my camera? <laughs> you can combine it with another model that contains, for example, a skin or whatever. So you can combine data from various sources. And go ahead and look at the Castle Game Engine examples how to do it. And if uh, and I will explore those models, those formats actually later if this is uh, interesting to you because I don't know those particular. To formats, but I'm sure the answer is yes. All right. I put a link in the chat for the supported model formats from your document. Thank you, exactly. There. Um, there's a question here. Uh, Conrad's asking if digital assets are mostly bundled into resource files in the EXE or separate uh, outside, yeah. like separate files. Yeah, so you basically, of course, I mean, with Castle Game Engine, you have the option to kind of go both ways. In particular, what we what we do for you, you we kind of provide an URL management. It's kind of a built into Castle Game Engine. So we kind of never use file names. We just use URLs. And in particular, we have a very, very special URL uh, scheme. It's called the data, Castle data. Let me actually pull up the uh, data directory. There it is. Okay, and uh, so uh, how can I write into chat? I'm so new here. Can you uh, repaste it, <laughs> please? I'm, I'm so so confused. Uh, okay, yeah. I don't think you have access to the to the chat window, so. Ah, okay. So let's explain. Okay, so yeah, so we have this our own uh, URL scheme, as an URL protocol. So just URL protocol for accessing files that are data of your game, and you can use it like by default. What it's doing on desktop is it's actually just looking at the regular files in your data subdirectory, because. I guess in regular games, it doesn't have too much benefit to actually bundle everything inside the exe. But you can go ahead and tweak it. In particular, you can define your own URL protocols. You can register them with Castle Game Engine. And then you can say that this data, it actually points to something else than we figure out by default. So for example, this data can actually point to the resources inside your exe file. And then you just write a very simple loader that pulls up the resources from your exe file and kind of exposes them as URLs. So you can have to have a well, almost a virtual field system through which you can access any data you want. And this also plays in, this is an incredibly important thing on mobile also, because for example, on Android, when you have an Android application, well, those files that are bundled with your application, well, they are not regular files. I mean, they are not placed on a regular field system that you just view, see as a regular user. And uh, yeah, our Castle Data Protocol just kind of abstracts it away from you. So if you just use Castle Data Protocol throughout your application, your application will just work in a cross-platform way, well, everywhere. And then, right. sorry, so you can, so it works everywhere, and you can adjust it, I guess, however you want. By default, though, are, they are just simple files because that's simple for development. Yeah. So Frank also asks, is uh, is OpenGL based? The Castle Game Engine, if yes, is there a way to tweak OpenGL parameters? Yes and yes. <laughs> it's OpenGL based. Uh, you can also use OpenGL ES on mobile. Of course, you have to use OpenGL ES. On desktop, you can switch between OpenGL and OpenGL ES. And yes, you can tweak OpenGL parameters. You can collect like those parameters, how to create a context, and kind of, you know, if you know what you're doing, then you can also even 
issue your own OpenGL commands as long as they stay within that, you know, use the modern OpenGL API, they will not conflict. They will play nicely with Castle Game Engine. So yes, and you can utilize OpenGL commands if you would like to, though I would have to mention here that we also plan to have Vulkan support in the future. I mean, probably multiple renderers, but the Vulkan will be definitely the first because it's kind of the future. It's a harder renderer to make, but with a lot of, uh, well, with a lot of benefits. I mean, you, you, you're just much faster. You can split into cores and you can render things much faster. So we will have a Vulkan render in the future. And there, of course, well, it's kind of a warning. Yeah? I mean, go ahead and tweak OpenGL if you want. But remember, then this will put you on the spot where you just have to use OpenGL, which will be always available, but you know. Maybe like, you know, in five years, the Vulkan renderer will just be amazing. And then you will have to port your OpenGL code. So just a fair right. warning. The question here, do you recommend or can you make 2D games with this as well? I would recommend, yes. <laughs> that, that's an easy question for me. I'm, uh, I'm subjective. Uh, subjective? Not objective. Uh, but yes, uh, but yes, and honestly, yes. <laughs> you can go ahead and uh, download the engine, and you can go ahead and test the 2D game example that I shown with those spreadsheets and with this uh, and with this dragon. And it's really just a matter of dragging stuff around. And uh, yeah, it basically works. In our game engine demos, we have also, for example, a two-dimensional platformer demo, which is also something you can just download download from each I.O. and just play with it. So uh, yeah, you can just create the two-dimensional games. Uh, and yes, and the physics works there too, which is something I like to mention because I like to mention physics. So yes. Yeah, actually, I'm just went out to your Castle Game Engine I.O. site here, and you got really good documentation too. Here's a link to 2D games and <laughs> tutorial designing a 2D world. So yeah, man, this is like, I don't know what it's like. I'm gonna get started. I'm excited. I want to make a game now, or <laughs> use use <laughs> use the engine in uh, 3D visualization as well. 3D visualization as well. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you all for the good words. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, I will point out also that you are on Patreon. I'll put the link out for your Patreon here. So if you're excited like I am, I'm excited. Then I would suggest go out to Patreon and and contribute and. Uh, you know, that's a great way to encourage uh, specific features as well at different levels here. Yeah, I will mention about the Patreon since we're on the topic, <laughs> so that we are also actually, I mean, I, I'm hiring actually one extra person to help with the engine. That's Andrzej Kiliański. He's done a lot of excellent work. So the goal of the Patreon is not really like to um, put money into my pocket, <laughs> actually on the contrary. <laughs> I want the money to go out of my pocket and I want to hire essentially the, the great people like Andrzej, Eugene, Eugene Loza that have been working on the engine. I want to essentially be able to hire people to work on the engine as a developers and as a graphic people uh, because I'm already doing it in a small way and it pays off. I mean, it's great when there are multiple people that just commit uh, yeah, their time to improving the engine. So this is what the Patreon is really for. In the ideal world, this is just a way for the community to basically provide uh, well, some small salary to the people that work on the engine. And this has really existing thing has already helped like grow the engine because well yeah more people more time and uh, amazing people more amazing features that are being developed so thank you for the link to patreon and yes if you like yeah. it go ahead thank you it's worth it <laughs> worth sending it twice <laughs> all right well thank you thank you thank you for all the work you do in the community and for your time and effort in this session today and i'm sure we'll see you around more thank you thank you very much for having me thank you